Before I begin, if you haven't seen my first Scooby-Doo Iceberg video, go watch that and then come back to this video. So, since posting my initial Iceberg on Scooby-Doo, it was brought to my attention by many of you in the comments that I missed a lot of great stuff in the universe of Scooby-Doo. In an effort to remedy this, I thought it would be a great idea to make a follow-up video on all the things that I missed. Now strap in, it's going to be a long one. Since this video will be mostly me talking, I recommend just listening to the audio and kicking back. Now this won't be a traditional ice break video with a bunch of layers. However, I did try to order the items from most known to least known with the absence of an official layer for each. Please don't hesitate to let me know if I missed anything else in the comments as I tried my best to include everyone's additions. If you commented after March 18th, I probably didn't include yours just because I was trying to get this video out ASAP. Finally, major spoiler warning. If you don't want anything spoiled from the Scooby-Doo franchise, do not, and I repeat, do not watch the rest of this video. And with all that said, let's get into the video. So before I get into the real meat, I want to go over some clarifications on old stuff from the original Iceberg video. If you want to skip past this, feel free to go to the timestamp on screen. The first thing I'd like to clarify is the real monsters in Scooby-Doo from the first Iceberg. As I said in the original video, I had no idea what the real monsters in Scooby-Doo meant. but from what I've gathered in the comments of my original video and from my own research on the subject, real monsters in Scooby-Doo originates from how there are actually real monsters seen throughout the entirety of the show. Of course, here and there, we do see people dressed up in costumes, but for a good majority of the franchise's run, we see real-life monsters. This can be seen in the first four direct-to-video Scooby-Doo movies, with real zombies, real cat people, and real cat gods being in the Zombie Island film, real ghosts and witches being in the Witches Ghost movie, alien invaders having real aliens, and lastly cyber chase with a literal computer virus coming to life. Other notable instances include 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, which is all about real ghosts, and a good majority of the TV shows having real instances of supernatural activity. Even the theatrical movies have real ghosts, real demons, and random pandemonium. Real monsters are clearly a thing in the Scooby-Doo universe, and Scooby-Doo is no stranger to the occasional real spirit or ghost. There's also an explanation of how Scooby-Doo is exposed to these ghosts, but that's going to be much later in this video. Scooby-D So to reiterate on this, I did explain very well on my first video about who Scooby-D was, but one detail I actually did not go over was how the show planned on having an incestuous relationship between Scooby-D and Scooby-Doo. Obviously, the show never got this far into developing this relationship, as we never see this come to light. It is however known that Scooby-D was in fact one of Scooby-Doo's love interests. Which honestly, isn't really the weirdest thing in the world considering they're dogs, but it's still pretty weird that Hanna-Barbera was even considering this. The Addams Family and the Warner Problem This is just one short clarification on how the Addams Family were in the Scooby-Doo universe. So, in addition to there being an episode in the new Scooby-Doo movies where the Addams Family joins in, there was actually an issue going on in the outside world in regard to this episode. The episode's title being Wednesday is Missing. This is the only episode that has no DVD release due to an ongoing appearance rights conflict with the creators of The Addams Family. Basically, The Addams Family creators don't want this episode to be sold for whatever reason they have. This is just another little fun fact about the episode, so with all of those out of the way, let's get onto the real meat of the video. Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated of everything, this was probably the most highly requested addition to this video, which is hilarious considering that I did in fact have this in my original script for that video. Now, along with most of you, this show is probably my favorite of the entire Scooby-Doo franchise. I have seen the entire show and all I gotta say is it's the best piece of Scooby-Doo history I've ever watched. This show is very different from the other Scooby-Doo shows as it carries an actual story arc which most of the other shows don't bother to do, and even when they do have one, it's usually nowhere near as good as this one. The reason this show's story is so much better than the others in the Scooby-Doo franchise is because it gives each character their own small problems and develops everyone to the point where these characters feel more like just characters, they feel like real people. The world building in this show is fantastic as well. Every little detail about Crystal Cove gives off that wonderful, small town horror movie vibe. Along with all that was said here, the show also manages to keep the same spooky mysteriousness that you would expect from a Scooby-Doo series. There are also very unexpected elements thrown into the mix such as drama, love, and violence which only add to the overall quality of the show. The sad thing about Mystery Incorporated is that the series only lasted around two seasons. 
It was, however, teased for a while by the creators that they did in fact have a season 3 planned out, but Cartoon Network wasn't having it. I say this because Cartoon Network actually cancelled this show, but unlike most cancelled shows, the creators were able to properly end it before it was completely taken off the air. With no sign of a season 3, however, I believe it's safe to say that this show is done for. If you guys haven't seen this series, please give it a watch, you will not regret it. Another thing you guys won't regret is hitting that like button. If you guys have made it this far in the video, please smash the like button as not only does it let me know I'm doing a great job, it also does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. With that being said, let's move on to the next item on the iceberg. Scooby Doo is an alien. In Mystery Incorporated, we learn about the ancient godlike race called the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki are a godlike race that comes to Earth every few thousand years. However, the only problem that they have is that they contain no physical form. They must resort to inhabiting animals in order to talk to humans and help them. This is why Scooby-Doo is able to talk throughout the franchise. It is also said that because of Scooby-Doo's Anunnaki heritage, that he ages much more closely to how humans age. Not much else needs to be said here, but let's move on. Scrappy-Doo, Scooby-Dum, and Flim Flam. All three of these characters are side characters in the Scooby-Doo franchise, the most known being Scrappy-Doo. Scrappy-Doo is a Great Dane puppy and nephew to Scooby-Doo. He is most known for his first appearance in the TV series Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, which mainly revolved around the same premise as the old shows, only now with Scrappy-Doo thrown into the mix. Fun fact before I explain the other characters, the creators thought that Scrappy-Doo was originally too independent as a character, which was apparently a bad thing to teach kids, so the writers actually toned him down in later episodes to compensate, and even stopped airing reruns of the first few episodes to combat this. Scooby-Dum is Scooby-Doo's cousin that lives with Ma and Pot Skillet in a swamp out in southern Georgia. His first ever appearance being in the third episode of the Scooby-Doo show. However, he was nothing more than a supporting character of the gang, and he only shows up in around four episodes throughout the entirety of that show's run. Flim Flam's first appearance was in the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, which we will go more in depth about later in the video. He is known to be a clever street child that joined the gang to assist them in returning all 13 ghosts back to the chest of demons. Aside from his initial appearance in the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo, he also appears in the movie Curse of the 13th Ghost as well as Scooby-Doo Mystery Inc. At the end of the 13 ghost film, Flim Flam's character is shown selling souvenirs and merchandise based on their 13 ghost adventures. This ending to his character is explained further in Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated where they explain that Flim Flam is in jail with 25 plus years due to his constant conning. All three of the characters mentioned are nothing more than supporting characters but nonetheless are essential to the Scooby-Doo franchise. Scooby Natural If you don't know about the show Supernatural, it is basically just a show about, you guessed it, supernatural occurrences. However, the show goes more in depth on these two brothers named the Winchester Brothers and they must fight off supernatural beings such as monsters, demons, and gods that roam the earth. How does this tie into Scooby-Doo? Well, there was actually a crossover episode between these two shows titled Scooby Natural. In this episode, the Winchester Brothers are sucked into an episode of Scooby-Doo Where Are You? But not just a random episode made for the crossover. They are actually sucked into a real episode specifically episode 16 of Scooby-Doo Where Are You, titled A Night of Fright is No Delight. The original episode of Scooby-Doo Where Are You ends with the Scooby gang unmasking the bad guy, as usual, but in Scooby Natural, the Winchester brothers are forced to help the Scooby gang when they open up the Scooby-Doo universe to real supernatural occurrences. This happens when after being sucked into the episode, a ghost is actually brought inside with them. The entire episode is the brothers trying to capture said ghost while trying to keep the Scooby gang oblivious to what's going on. Eventually, we see this scene take place where the gang realizes exactly what's going on. This ties into my earlier item about the real monsters in Scooby-Doo as this episode serves as a potential reason or explanation as to how real monsters found their way into the show. The Rated R Version of the Scooby-Doo Movie James Gunn, who was the director of the original Scooby-Doo movie from 2002, explained that he initially planned on making an edgier film geared towards older kids and adults, explaining how the movie was initially supposed to take on an R rating. It's said that the first cut of the movie was in fact rated R by the MPAA, which then caused the studio to push for a more clean film for kids. 
This forced James Gunn to cut out a lot of the edgier content of the movie, with the team going as far as CGIing away some of the female star's cleavage. There was some unexplored territory that this movie would have dealt with, such as Velma being confirmed as gay in the movie. Obviously, we know this didn't happen as the movie that we got was a more kid-friendly version than what was stated here. Scooby-Doo Movie Deleted Scene This is in reference to a deleted scene from the Scooby-Doo movie where Daphne finds Velma dancing around in a type of two-piece bikini to some very strange music. It's really unclear why this scene was removed. I personally attribute it to the movie being shot down from being rated R to PG. However, a lot of fans and a lot of people in the comments here love to speculate that it's because Velma's actress appears more attractive than Daphne in this scene. Believe whatever you want. Let's move on to the next one. Cut monsters from the Scooby-Doo 2 movie. So apparently a lot of monsters were cut from the final version of Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. A link to the Reddit post discussing these cut monsters can be found in the description. However, I will be flashing some of the unknown monsters on screen. It kind of sucks when studios do stuff like this, but I can see where they come from. Whether they want to get the runtime of the movie down or just think that some of the monsters being in the movie adds nothing, it makes sense as to why some of these were cut. The sad thing though is that some of these monsters weren't just one-offs for the movie, but actual inclusions in the Scooby-Doo franchise. Not much else to be said here, but if you guys do want to check out the other monsters in the movie, I will leave a link in the description for this. Go ahead and check it out. 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo is the 7th incarnation in the Scooby-Doo franchise. It appeared in September 7th of 1985 and was the first show in the franchise where the Scooby-Doo characters encounter primarily supernatural creatures instead of criminals wearing disguises. There was even a main story arc in this show. As the first episode starts off with the gang being thrown off course from their trip to Honolulu and crash landing Daphne's plane in Tibet. While they're there, they discover a chest inside of a temple that unleashes the 13 most terrifying and powerful ghosts and demons to walk the face of the earth. The gang then embarks on a worldwide quest to recapture the ghosts before they wreak havoc on the world. The show's main arc was never fully concluded though as the show only lasted 13 episodes with not all 13 of the ghosts being captured. However, they did release a film titled Scooby-Doo and the Curse of the 13th Ghost which directly continues the story from the series and attempts to conclude it. I say attempts because although they offered an actual ending to the saga, it felt more like a retcon than an actual ending to this story arc. Where's the caveman slash watch me swoosh right in? This is in reference to two very specific video clips of Scooby-Doo. The two clips being Scooby-Doo memes that were originally taken from the YouTube series called The Misadventures of Skooks. This was nothing more than a series of YouTube poops that were worked into a compilation style video format. It was released in 2011 and met with lots of great feedback from the YouTube poop community. For those who are wondering why this guy keeps saying YouTube poop, YouTube poop is a style of YouTube videos meant to cause shock and confusion while maintaining some form of humor and entertainment. Honestly, they're usually just mashups of pre-existing media that gets edited in a very high-paced and weird manner that can only be described as YouTube poop. Instead of trying to describe what happens in these two clips, I'll just let them play one after another starting now. Watch me swing right in. Am I glad he's frozen in there and that we're out here and that he's the sheriff and that we're frozen out here and that we're in there and I just remembered we're out here. What I want to know is where's the caveman? Now that that's over, let's move on. Fred loses it. This item refers to a Cartoon Network bumper from the early 2000s. This bumper features Fred cursing because of people constantly talking and asking about the scarf that he wears. Instead of doing my best to describe it, I'll just play the clip for you guys. You know, throughout the years, a lot of people have asked me, Fred, why the scarf? And I always tell them the same thing. Why don't you mind your own f***ing business, pal? I'm a cartoon star. I have more f***ing people telling me what the what I want to wear. So don't be afraid to express your true self. And remember, fashion first. This is definitely not something that shows could probably get away with now, but nonetheless, it remains a part of Cartoon Network's history. Bravo Scooby-Doo. Bravo Scooby-Doo is a crossover episode that aired during the first season of Johnny Bravo. The crossover entails Johnny Bravo getting help from the Mystery Inc. gang in order to find his missing aunt. 
It is kind of important to note that the gang that joins Johnny Bravo is the gang from the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You series. Not much else needs to be said here, it was simply one of those one-off crossover episodes that series tend to do every once in a while. With that said, let's move on to the next item. Shaggy and Scooby-Doo get a clue. Shaggy and Scooby-Doo get a clue is probably one of the weirdest inclusions in the Scooby-Doo universe as it heavily focuses on Shaggy and Scooby and less on the rest of the cast. In my opinion, this creates an imbalance in the characters and seems to be a quite popular opinion from what I've read online. However, I don't think that the show is bad. I think it's just different from most of the other entries in the Scooby-Doo franchise. It definitely strays away from that spooky mystery solving formula that the series is known for, but it does have some positives. For example, aside from the different animation style and voice acting, this incarnation of the franchise even had its own story arc. The story of this show is based around the disappearance of Shaggy's uncle. After Shaggy realizes his uncle is missing, he and Scooby band together to fight the evil organization ran by Dr. Phineas in order to save the world. Quite a ridiculous story arc, but I think it's pretty fitting for the style that the show was going for. If you guys have time to invest in something different in the Scooby-Doo franchise, try giving the show a watch. Sixth member of the gang. This addition is in reference to this reddit post from the r slash scooby-doo subreddit. The poster explains that they remember the show having a sixth member of the scooby-doo gang, meaning that in addition to Scooby, Shaggy, Velma, Daphne, and Fred, there was a sixth member. And he's not talking about Scrappy-Doo as he explains that the sixth member's name was Thomas and that he wore a plain red shirt, yellow bell bottoms, and white shoes. The post goes on to say how there was a lost episode that they remember where the sixth member of the gang is seemingly tortured. Once you get around to this part of the post, you realize this is just a very bad creepypasta. The post just goes on and on about how Thomas was sealed away and never released in later episodes. If you guys want to read the entire post, feel free to. I really don't want to go into detail about this. I think it's just super weird, but I will link it in the description below. Shaggy is a ventriloquist. This is one of those random online theories that explains how Shaggy is an expert ventriloquist that does Scooby-Doo's voice for him. Citing that Scooby-Doo's voice is similar to Shaggy's and also stating that the gang avoids talking to Scooby-Doo directly because they know Shaggy is the one that does the voice for him. This definitely isn't true, especially with the incarnation of Mystery Incorporated, since that show explains why Scooby-Doo can talk. I could see how someone might think of this as a little fun thought experiment, but it's nothing more than that. Just a fun thought experiment. Shaggy is a gymnast and track athlete. This one was actually a relatively quick addition to the iceberg. In Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, I believe it explicitly states that Shaggy is athletic and the fastest member of Mystery Incorporated. Also, Daphne straight up explains how he's the best gymnast in their school and that he runs track. Another point to add, and as stupid as it may sound, Shaggy used his agility and athletic abilities to beat up all these members of this biker gang. Once you take all of this in, you start to slowly realize that Shaggy is in fact the most athletic member of the Mystery Inc. gang. Before I move on to these last six additions, I wanted to say that I really didn't know how to order these as I could see a fair amount of these being least known, so I will say now that these are not ordered in any specific matter. With that being said, let's move on to the next edition of the iceberg. Scooby Apocalypse The Scooby Apocalypse is a rather interesting addition to the Scooby-Doo franchise. It's a monthly comic book series published by none other than DC Comics, which reimagines the characters from the Scooby-Doo franchise and sets them in a post-apocalyptic world. This comic centers around the Mystery Inc. gang trying to find a cure for a virus called the Nanite Virus. The virus is said to have created a world full of mutated creatures, which the gang must now traverse through in search of the cure. Now, I haven't been able to read any of this just because I'm not willing to pay for it, but from the screenshots I was able to look at, this comic takes a more serious approach to the series, similar to that of the Mystery Incorporated series. Not much else to be said here, let's move on. Scoob and Shag webcomic So I initially thought this was just going to be a webcomic with a darker take on Scooby and Shaggy, but after reading about 35 additions to the webcomic, I can say that this is much more complex than just that. The series initially started out as a slapstick webcomic with no real plot other than stupid one-off jokes with Scooby and Shaggy as the characters. However, after the 15th comic, the series starts getting some continuous plot going. From what I've read so far, 
The plot starts with Scooby and Shaggy crashing into a tree, and then they meet Kermit the Frog after wandering around for a while. Kermit then takes him to this house where they all get spooked out. Scooby shoots Mario from the Super Mario Bros. series, and then some Disney characters come in. I know this sounds all random, but you guys can see from the screenshots I'm showing you that this is actually a real thing. We are then introduced to Mickey Mouse, and this is where the comic just starts getting straight up sadistic with some of the additions, and just super, super weird. I don't want to spoil anything past what I've already said here, so if you guys are interested, I'd suggest giving it a read yourself. I will leave a link to it in the description. Each addition to the comic is only like one strip long and takes no more than 30 seconds to read, so if you guys have like an hour of your time to waste, or if you're into that creepypasta type of stuff, you can probably get through the entire thing in one sitting. It was definitely not something I would have expected from a webcomic, but nonetheless, I enjoyed reading it as far as I did. Game Boy Advanced Secret Code So, apparently the Marvel Cinematic Universe wasn't the first to do post credit scenes, as in the Scooby-Doo 2 movie Monsters Unleashed, there is a post credit scene where this clip plays. Event secret code. <laughs> you see, there was a Game Boy game by the same name as the movie that came out around the same time. And if you were to use the code in the game, it was supposed to unlock something very, well, secret. Now finding out exactly what secret it unlocked took me a lot longer than I expected. Every website I looked into wouldn't give me a straight answer as to what the code was used for in the game. They would just say it unlocked a special surprise for the gamer. After around 40-ish minutes of digging, I eventually got to an answer. So right near the end of the game, you are brought to this screen that straight up asks you if you have seen Scooby-Doo 2 or not. And if you did and you stayed past the post credit scene, you enter the code from the movie and if you get the code correct, you get the true ending to the game. I imagine this would be pretty frustrating to deal with though because imagine playing through the entire game and then when you get to the end, the game asks you something you have no idea about and if you enter the wrong code, you get what I like to call the ambiguous ending to the game. This ambiguous ending isn't non-canon or fake, it's just not the same ending you would get as if you put the right code in. What happens when you enter the wrong code is you don't find out who the masked evil person was that you were chasing throughout the entire game. Which means if you played through the whole game to figure out who the hell this masked person was, you don't get to know. All because you didn't watch Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleash and stay after for the post credit scene. What if you actually did watch the movie and you didn't bother to watch the after credit sequence? What an oversight. Like, imagine actually going to the theater and watching this movie and then buying the game and then getting to this point and you realize you can't get the true ending because you didn't bother to stay after the movie. Besides that though, if you do get the correct code, you get the true ending to the game, which is basically the same ending as the movie. The team unmasks the evil person, and it's the weather woman from the beginning, but then, oh wait, it's actually Jonathan Jacobo with another mask on. Pretty disappointing to say the least, as I would expect with a secret code like this that you would get a different type of ending from the movie, but let's move on. The Solver Squad the Solver Squad is referring to a series of videos by Charborg, Kricken, and a few other YouTube creators starting in 2018 and seemingly ending in 2020. The series just entails a bunch of YouTubers role-playing as characters from the Scooby-Doo franchise in wheelchairs. The game that's being played is Gary's Mod and each episode basically entails the so-called Solver Squad taking on a different building and just having lots of funny hijinks together. After having watched the first episode of the series, it's pretty damn funny, and just a really weird piece of Scooby-Doo history to say the least. If you have time to waste and you don't know what to watch, give these videos a watch. I'll leave a link in the description to a playlist that I found containing the full series of episodes. The Scooby-Doo Universe The Scooby-Doo Universe, or so-called the Scooby-Doo Universe, dubbed by Torsten Adair, who wrote this article on it, is the theory that every single crossover, every character, and every series, not just in the Scooby-Doo show, but of all of cartoon history, takes place in the Scooby-Doo universe. I'm not even going to bother explaining the extent of this theory because, well, just take a look at this chart. Clearly this guy put a lot of effort into this, and just explaining it in a little chunk seems like a crime. So even though I'm going to give you guys just a little snippet of the theory, I suggest reading the article linked in the description below because there is way more information there than I will give here. 
The gist though, is that every crossover gets overlapped and links to the other crossovers in the series. For example, let's take this little strand here. In Scooby-Doo Mask of the Blue Falcon, the Mystery Ink Gang has a crossover episode with the Blue Falcon from the Dino Mutt Show. And then in Dexter's Laboratory, Blue Falcon has a crossover into Dexter's show. Since Blue Falcon was in Scooby-Doo and is now appearing in Dexter's Laboratory, technically Dexter's Laboratory is now a part of the Scooby-Doo universe. And this line of logic just keeps going on and on until eventually it just spirals out of control. And shows that haven't even appeared in the Scooby-Doo franchise, let alone even mentioned in the Scooby-Doo franchise, are now somehow linked to the show's universe. Again, this is a very complicated theory that this guy has going on, so I will leave a link below that explains it all in further detail. Scooby-Doo exists in three timelines. The Scooby-Doo franchise is actually quite more complex than it gives off at first glance. There's said to be three total timelines in the show's run. We have the first timeline, which can be called the Coolsville universe, and in this universe, the gang lives, obviously, in Coolsville, and this is where the following shows take place. Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? The new Scooby-Doo movies, The Scooby-Doo Show, Scooby and Scrappy-Doo, The All-New Scrappy-Doo Show, The New Scooby-Doo Mysteries, A Pup Named Scooby-Doo, What's New Scooby-Doo, and finally, Scooby-Doo Get a Clue. In this timeline, the gang has known each other since childhood, and eventually everyone grows up and goes their separate ways, as known in the Scooby and Scrappy episodes, where we see that the gang isn't really all there as a good chunk of them are away at their jobs. We then have the second timeline, which I will call the Crystal Cove timeline. The gang doesn't meet until they are teens in this universe and have most of their teen years spent in Crystal Cove. This is where all of the following incarnations take place. Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, Be Cool Scooby-Doo, the live action TV movies, not to be mistaken with the theatrical movies, and any of the direct-to-video films besides the first four. Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated is confirmed to have a separate timeline as explained in the ending where the timeline changes for the better, leaving the gang with better jobs and overall better lives. This is then said to continue on into Be Cool Scooby-Doo, which then tapers off into the Scooby-Doo and Guess Who franchise, and then all of the aforementioned direct-to-video movies and specials take place after. The last timeline consists of just the theatrical releases of the movies as any other work cannot be fit neatly into the theatrical movie's timelines. Now, do I believe in this three timeline theory? Mm, not really. I do believe that there are two separate Scooby-Doo universes as indicated in the show Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, and I also believe that there is some type of continuity in the show. However, to think that the writers had all this in mind is pretty bonkers, as most of this can just be chalked up to people stretching parts of the show to fit their theory. Well, that was the video, guys. This one actually took me quite a long time to make as I had to do a lot more research than the first iceberg. This is just because some of the items on this list were not very easy to find information on. Now, before I end the video, I would like to thank the following people for helping me in getting ideas for this episode. Now, before I end this, I would like to thank the following people for helping me in getting ideas for this video. If you see your name flash on screen, it means that I most likely took the idea you commented and put it in this video. If I didn't take your idea and you did comment before March 18th, it probably got lost in the sea of comments and for that I apologize. However, I really want to say thank you to all of you in my community for helping me make this video. But also on a side note, I'm in shock that my original iceberg is doing this well. I really appreciate all the recent support from all of you and I will continue to make videos like this in the future. If you guys commented with an idea, I really appreciate the help and I hope you guys like what I made here. Speaking of which, if you guys enjoyed the video, hit that subscribe button and remember to hit the notification bell so you guys do not miss another upload. I will be uploading another iceberg on the Marvel Cinematic Universe soon, so be on the lookout for that. With that said, I will see you all in the next video.